have a special episode today with Benjamin Lopez. He's an investment analyst at Utah Retirement System, a $33 billion public pension system. Ben works with a private equity team with a focus in venture capital investments. He's a current board member at Lausanne Entrepreneur Institute at the University of Utah. So welcome to SheVC. I'm your founder and host, Guy C. to welcome you, Ben. So Ben is a part of the Utah Retirement System, and we are glad to have him here. Glad to be here. Thank you, Ben. And um, I mean, we have been in touch. We discussed so much, and especially you have a very interesting background. You had been an entrepreneur before, and now you are an institutional LP. So tell us about your journey into the world of institutional LP. Yeah, ha happy to do so. I would, I would say my journey is probably not the most common one. I, I moved from Guatemala here in 2002, um, here to be in the United States. And, and you know, I started college at the beginning of the, the great financial recession. And, and um, so it was all over the news. You couldn't escape it. And, and I, I, at that time I was currently studying chemistry. Yet I keep hearing about the stock market coming down and, and I thought maybe I should learn something about what that means and, and how that operates. So I decided to take a couple of classes into finance. Um, and by the end of the day, you know, I, I ended up graduating with a chemistry degree and went and went to work for the pharmaceuticals. Um, in the meantime, I kept learning about the stock market and, and finance and how the whole thing worked. And I thought to myself, well, I'm doing this out of my own free will and choice. Instead of being a wannabe investor, I should probably get paid for it. So I went back to business school and, and with, with that in mind, I decided to really focus on, on finance and investing. I was fortunate enough to join a small uh, venture, student-led venture fund called University Gold Fund. And I kind of fell in love with the business of, of you know, looking at different companies, understanding their, their, their drivers for value creation and the fundamentals and, and really loved it. So after that, I joined a small buyout fund and after doing a stint, like you mentioned, uh, as, as a co-founder for, for a startup, um, I ended up at, at, at the U Utah Retirement System, so or URS, which is the public pension plan for the state of Utah. And, and you know, one of the reasons uh, I love it here is because the Utah Retirement System, in a sense, specifically the private equity team, which was formed when I, you know, when, when I joined, it's, it's almost like a startup with a conglomerate. We get to wear a lot wow. of hats, We're very wow. innovative. Um, and, and have done a lot of cool things. And then that, that gets me excited. That's great. So tell us a little bit more about Utah Retirement System. It's a $33 billion investment platform. And being in Utah, a lot of people don't know about it. So would love to give some more details to many of the audiences who are fund managers and emerging fund managers. They would love to know a little bit more about Utah Retirement System. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like you mentioned, you know, depending on the day, we're about thirty-three billion dollars, um, and it's a the, the difference or benefit of Utah. It's that it's a combined system, and what that means is that we have fire, police, um, teachers, and all other public employees under one umbrella. So, for the for the state of Utah, that you know maybe it's a smaller relative to other states, it really allows us to get scale. Um, and you know, for, for all intents and purposes, uh, in a very simplified way, where you can say we're a kind of a private trust, um, and that what that means is we're not subject to FOIA, so the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and for venture capital firms, information that comes to us stays within our walls, um, and, and that's that's very useful. Um, what what I think differentiates us versus other maybe public pension plans, you know, we started investing in private equity a long time ago, more, more than thirty years ago. And, and our model has been one that's just steady eddy approach. Um, the, the people at URS since the beginning before I was there have a very asset allocation that, that's very dynamic and, and it, it looks more like an endowment than like actually a public pension plan. And that has gone good for us. Um, you know, so today, you know, the public pension plan it, it invests in anything from fixed income to venture capital. And that diversification has, has done well as well. That's great. And, and since you guys have been investing for so long, I would love to know, like, how's your risk profile adjustment has changed 
over years. And uh, do you think there will be further changes considering, you know, the uncertainties and volatility in the market right now? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I, I think maybe I can start personally as I grow older, um, my, my risk profile has changed to being a little more conservative. I'm, <laughs> I'm a risk taker, but you know, I find myself driving slower, you know, thinking about, well, if I jump over that, I'm going to break my leg or whatnot. So, um, you know, as you translate that to what we're doing at, 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 at URS, it, um, you know, we, we think about investments on a risk adjusted return. Yeah. Um, so, so we're always cautious about the risk and the risk that we're taking. I, I would say, that the 2007 2008 recession kind of gave a, a lot of people a wake up call and, and you know you you see this on twitter right now where a, a lot of vc managers are saying well in the last great recession all these great companies got formed yeah. so now it's a great opportunity so you know on one end of the of the risk profile it's kind of nice to not know the fundamentals and be kind of naive and, and, and if you were you know looking back in 2012 2013 when facebook went public uh, and all your friends were using it you're like maybe i should just invest in it without knowing the fundamentals and that would have been a great investment <laughs> when you look and learn the fundamentals you say i don't know if this is going to be a good investment i would say you know you translate that to, to investing now the 2007 2008 is a great example where a lot of fund managers said listen these companies got formed then this time around they can form again so in a sense, the, all of that history really allows you to take these so-called risk investments and de-risk them because of the knowledge that you gain over time. Um, I, I, that's the case, you know, for me, and I think that's the case for for Utah retirement systems, where we have used the past as a benefit for the future now, and, and, and what maybe be, you know, in hindsight looks scary, maybe now looks very attractive uh, after understanding the fundamentals and, and what really drives you know value creation. That's great, and uh, so. When you're talking about investments, you guys are fund investors. So you're investing in early stage funds, you're investing in growth stage funds, which are later stage funds. And we know that early stage fund have different fund return multiples compared to you know, late stage funds. How do you navigate that dynamics, especially as an institutional LP? That's a great question. Um, it's it's challenging um I, you know I, I think you have to look at the what what the goals of the institution are uh, for for once I, I would say and i'm not you know if we were to generalize later stage funds are more ir driven and that's just a function of you're maybe you know investing a couple months before the company gets acquired or goes public and therefore you have a real quick realization um early stage funds are maybe more multiple driven yeah. with the fact yeah. that you know, the, the value creation gets compounded over time. So with, with that in mind, more v venture capital fund GPs underwrite a, a fund for a 3x net, which means, you know, you get your three times your money yes. in, in, in a period of time. Um, you know, if you look at what the public data that Cambridge has out there and you say, okay, if that's the case, and let's assume that we have access to top portile managers, how many times has at the top quartile being above a 3x <laughs> and the answer you get you know it's about 20 20 percent of the time mm. so in a 10-year period let's pretend you invested from 2000 to 2010 only two of those years you were actually able to get above a 3x uh investing in top quartile managers you, yeah. you know yeah. as, so you know we talk about the 3x but it, it, it's the, the truth of the matter is 3x is it's really hard to get now i have seen early stage funds do it, you know, get a 3X and above. And I have seen growth stage funds do it, get a 3X and above. So, you know, underneath all, all of these numbers, what really, for us at least, what really matters is just the quality of the manager. Mm -hmm. We believe that people are different, is, is really what makes the difference. And at the end of the day, if you're investing in a high quality manager, uh, whether that be, you know, early stage or late stage, um, that, that really is gonna, what's gonna be driving the return. Um, but that, that's kind of how we think about it. And, and, but, you know, it's, uh, it's easier said than done. That's how I would say it. That's great. And I think that's a great segue for me to ask you the next question, because early stage investors, you know, they're investing in super early stage seed, pre-seed. Now seed is also, um, pre-seed is also an institutional asset class. And late stage investments, they are 
focusing on sometimes series D, E, F, and more companies are staying private. And especially now, this is such an unprecedented uncertainty and more private companies tend to have, um, you know, far less short-term volatility compared to the publicly traded companies, which are subjected to rapid price changes from market forces. Uh, and that may not reflect their underlying company fundamentals. So as more companies tend to stay private as an institutional LP, an investor and in funds, how do you see the exit environment and how does it play in effect and when you guys are again investing in um, um, growth stage funds? Yeah, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, um, you know, I, I think you have both sides of the table, right? There's, there's the people that say more companies are staying private. And we've seen that clearly the numbers of public companies have decreased in the last 10 years. And, and then on the other side, you know, I, when, when a pandemic hits, I think there's a lot of people that are saying, boy, all these private companies should have gone public. Uh, you, you see what, you know, some of the technology companies that are public have done in the public markets and the value creation that that has happened. So, you know, when we looked at, at the exit environment, let's pretend we go back three or four years ago, we, what we were seeing, it, it was a lot of companies with big money acquiring, a, you know, a lot of incumbents. Um, that, that was, there's no news there. A lot of companies going public. Um, th there was a trend that was interesting for us in the sense that there was a lot of companies, venture back companies that are being acquired for, from a buyout manager. Um, and, I, and I think that that's a new trend there. You know, at the end of the day, GPs know how to structure a deal. Yeah. They also know how to structure an exit, right? So mm -hmm. when let's pretend that all strategic buyers kind of dry up in the IPO market, it's, it's closed. I would say that, that GPs will find a way to exit and that, and that can be, become really interesting, whether it be selling a, a, a portion of the company through, through a secondary sale, through another minority owner, whether it be selling the whole company to a buyout. Um, so I think we're going to see um, a, a couple of different exit strategies come up. Um, and this is, you know, back again, it's, it's a function of LPs, right? So I, me, us as an LP, everybody as an LP requires liquidity. Yes. And, and, yes. and, and then we're telling the, G, the GPs, we love that company at the same yeah. time. Yeah. It's been 20 years. You know, it'd be great to have some of that back. Um, so the GP, you know, is, is in this conundrum where like, listen, this company is compounding very well, but at the same time, we got to return some of that liquidity. So we will see some different exit. I think uh, we're seeing it right now. Some of some of the specs that are that are, are happening and that continues to increase. Um, I would say that if companies continue to to stay private longer, we will see a lot more sponsor to sponsor exits. Um, I think the pandemic probably put a put a light bulb in some of these companies that are big enough size that you can go public that. When the market, you know, the IPO window is open, that you should take advantage of that. Yeah. Some of the people yeah. taking advantage have been well paid for it. And, and, you know, but at the end of the day, there's really two exits. One, one's a, the acquisition, one's the public market. You can sell a minority. But um, so who is at the end of that? It's diff it might be different, but at the end of the day, there's, there's really just kind of those exits that are, that are structured. So. That's good. Yeah. I, I, I would like to know a little bit more about uh, when you talk about this, you know, the fund managers and then um, the, who are growth stage or early stage, we are seeing definitely right now uh, a rise of emerging fund managers, you know, uh, and can you elaborate the new market opportunities for this emerging fund managers? And uh, I mean, how do you think the market has changed? Because there will be so many emerging fund managers that will be reaching out to you to be an institutional key in their fund. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, you know it's, uh, it's proliferated. I joke that there, there might be more VC funds than startups out there at, at some point. <laughs> and uh, um, it, it's, it's definitely uh, an interesting time. Um, it, it, a time, like you mentioned, that, that brings opportunity. You know, there, depending on which report you read, I think last year there were some sort of like 800 to 1,000 seat fund managers. Uh, so what that means for us as an institutional LP, it, it means that we have maybe seen what we call, you know, shift of risk from what was a traditional early stage GP, which invested in series A, to what is now the seed or pre-seed kind oh, of yeah. institutional LP, uh, or GP, sorry, where 
you know, they're kind of taking the risk. And, and, we, and by that, I mean, you know, the loss ratio on those funds are probably significantly higher than maybe the traditional Series A uh, GP now. Uh, so so that, to us, seems like an opportunity where the Series A GP can say, if, if they have, you know, relationships with the pre-seed and seed investors, they can, in a sense, cherry pick that portfolio and, and create a fund that has very low loss ratios, but it's still on a risk reward profile. It seems very attractive from the proposal. So that that's I think it's it's a theme that's been um, recurring as, as as like you mentioned the seed and pre seed kind of asset class get institutionalized. Um, but it, it, it will be now you know with so many pre seed and seed funds, it's kind of sometimes hard to really get those relationships and cherry pick you know the best investments out of all those. At the same time, you can somebody can argue that it's too early to really know whether company A is going to be a big winner at that stage. Yeah. So it's interesting, but we, we think that, um, you know, the, the more capital into an asset class, making it sure that institutionalized, it really helps everybody at the end of the day. Um, it goes back to us and, and topic I mentioned at the beginning, the quality of the manner of the manager really matters, um, regardless, regardless of what uh, stage you're investing in. Yeah, that's good. And I would definitely like to talk about a little bit about, uh, liquidity position, you know, it's like venture capital is one asset class, which is also cyclical, but at the same time, we are seeing a lot of boom and bust cycle and, you know, especially as institutional LPs, you have really long lockup period. As institutional LP, you cannot redeem your capital out of market due to panic. So um, how do you um, look at the liquidity position, especially in this market? Um, and especially when you're approaching funds which have smaller lockup period versus longer lockup period. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting um, interesting topic. I, like you said, the illiquidity, you know, it allows us to not sell when, when prices are low, and we and we, put, and we bought high, right? Um, at the same time, the liquidity doesn't allow us to sell when prices are high and we bought low. So. Um, how, how do we manage that in, in, internally? You know, we have, like I mentioned at the beginning, a very steady eddy approach. And, and it really, I think uh, the liquidity, if you if you're need liquidity, you shouldn't be investing in private equity for the first part. If, if you're fine with <laughs> the liquidity premium, then I think what, what, what you do is, is, depending on, you know, the goals of the institution, you go ahead and say, can I take this long-term bet Hmm. Um, although the fund is a closing fund and, and the docs say, you know, it's about 10 years plus extensions, the average life of a fund on a VC fund is 15, if not more. So, so you got to be able to say, hey, I've got to take this long term bet. Um, now, you know, I think we've seen a lot of products come out uh, lately where they are offering liquidity to, to institutional LPs a little bit earlier. Now, clearly, you're le leaving a lot of cash on the table sometimes and, and you, so, so, you know, there's this this conundrum there that you're playing with. But the secondary markets have grown significantly and, and that's a way that, you know, some institutional LPs can get liquidity from, from yeah. funds. Okay. Um, you know, we uh, in U.S. we think uh, on very long terms. That's, uh, that's kind of, if you think about our funds specifically, we diversify ourselves. So they, we know that private equity is illiquid. We're investing in it because it's liquid. Uh, we understand that our capital will be parked for a couple of years and we're fine with that. That's that's kind of the bet we're taking. If for whatever reason we would need, and I, I don't know exactly why we would need it, but if we would need it, I'm assuming, you know, the secondary markets is there for, for that. And and there, we've seen a lot of products out there where they're either, either reducing the fund life. So instead of 10 years, it's seven years with a couple of extensions. We've seen a lot of GPs also say, um, you know, if you're investing in Series A and the company has increased and now it's in Series E, they're, they're not waiting for an acquisition or an IPO. They're just selling into that new round of financing uh, because their, their position is so high. So there's a lot of GPs are also, you know, delivering the, the DPI back to the LPs uh, a lot quicker. Um, so th there's a couple of new, new options out there in the market. No, that's good to know. I, I, I definitely want to end our podcast on a very high note. And that is the question about time diversification. You know, like venture capital has seen a great shift in the last 10 years with so much of 
pre-seed funds, as I said, becoming an institutional asset class. And um, whereas more seed funds are launching full stack VC funds with very large asset under management, they're raising really large funds. Um, so just to continue investing in the entire life cycle of the startup. So what's your perspective as an institutional LP on the time diversification in private venture investing? And how do you look at that particular dynamics? Yeah, we, we believe it's very important. You, you should have, uh, you know, time diversification. So if you look, you know, we look at just one fund specifically, the fund has a, a, ten, a life of 10 years, but it usually the investment period is about five years. Um, you know, what what has been happening lately is a lot of these funds are, are coming to market a lot quicker, meaning they're investing their fund significantly quicker than before. So, you know, as an institutional LP, you, in order to continue to, get some of that diversification over time, you wanna make sure that the docs allow, don't allow a GP to invest all the funding in one specific year, but allow it to diversify over a period of years. Um, so, you know, that's one of the beauties about private equity is that by investing in one vintage year, hopefully you're getting some sort of diversification. Now that, like, like I said, sometimes you're, you're, that's not your, on your control. The GP has control over, you know, the deal flow and, and how fast that, that investments get made. So it's important for you to invest year in and year out. And, 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 and what I mean by that is, let's pretend that you know, you're investing in 2004 to 2007, and in 2007, you decide to you know, pull out. All of a sudden, you have all these funds that are invested pre-recession, you know, that are gonna get hit from the recession, and you really missed on some of the best opportunities in 2007, 2008, and 2009, 2010, that on average, really kind of, you know, offset the losses that you would get maybe in a 2004, 2005 fund when a 2010 fund has, a, it's a very good vintage. So, you know, we think about the time of diversification, not, not only at the fund level, meaning can the GP invest over a period of two or three years or more, but also on a steady eddy approach where, you know, we, we're not smart enough to time the market. We have no idea what's gonna happen next year. So instead of doing that, we just say, you know, every year we're gonna be investing regardless of what's going on. And we believe that over over time, that's that's going to smooth out. So it, it's very important to have that. Um, I think the LPs, you know, sometimes get hurt when when they try to time the market um, instead of having just a just a program that goes steady eddy over time. So well said. Um, and I totally agree. I think timing a market is a fool's errand. But the way you guys are investing, that that's an amazing story to tell. And I'm super excited to have you on Chief VC. Thanks a lot, Ben, for coming. Thank you for having me.